Now, I have on my note here, I was reading an article in the paper, but it probably actually wasn't the paper. I was reading an article online because I don't get a newspaper anymore. I, mean, I remember you used to get in a newspaper all the time, but now the places that used to have regular newspapers, now it's not regular. But anyway, I was reading this article about the current culture of the world in general. And I found it interesting that this article mentioned that today's culture is one of the loneliest times in recent history. It basically says it seems that all the social media and real time news and information has not really made people feel closer to each other or to other people. Deep relationships have been replaced by dating sites, chat rooms, group text, or video meetings. And the actual bonds that grow from face-to-face -face interaction has declined to the point that people are not really connected to anyone or anything anymore. You look at the decline of civic organizations, you look at the decline of churches, and you see that the fact that, that community connections have withered to the point feel to where the point where people feel disconnected. This feeling of loneliness has created a sense of despair, and people start having low opinion of themselves and feel like they are unwanted. Now I hope that this trend can be reversed and turned around, but it won't happen behind gaming consoles and with our faces buried in our smartphones. We need as people to reconnect with each other and with our communities to establish the bonds that actually bring people closer together. Now today we're going to look at a passage that talks about someone being seen of worth very low value. And we need to understand that we are worth way more than we tend to think. Now we're going to look at Zechariah chapter 11 verses 10 through 14. Zechariah chapter 11 verses 10 through 14. Then I took my staff called favor and broke it, revoking the covenant I had made with all the nations. It was revoked on that day, and so the oppressed of the flock who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price in which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them, into, threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. Then I broke my second staff called Union, breaking the family bond between Judah and Israel. Now as you know, when I preach, I preach about the whole passage, but I pick a few verses that stuck out. And these verses stuck out about this whole passage. But this passage is the prophet Zechariah sharing the story of the two shepherds. Now, the first shepherd demonstrates how God will reject his people. And the second shepherd demonstrates how God will give his people over to the evil shepherds. So this prophecy is kind of telling the people what they can expect and what is going to happen in the future. Now, as we look at this whole passage, the part that really caught my attention as I was reading this are the verses I shared with you today about the two staffs and the pay. Now, I think there are some details in these words that we want to look that could be easily be missed if we didn't look at them in more detail. Now, the two staffs are called favor and union. And those names are kind of, they're pretty self-explanatory as we look at this whole uh, passage about the story of the two shepherds. They kind of get explained uh, pretty well there. But favor is a reference to God's favor. And we know that God's people turned away from him on many different occasions. And the breaking of the staff called favor was a literal, a literal breaking of God's gracious covenant with his people. The people had turned away from God and were focused on themselves. They were focused on their own greed and their own evil desires to the point that they were ripe for God's judgment. And that's what Zechariah is pointing out. And it was time that they paid for their rebellion 
and the rejecting of God, which was, was uh, shown by the breaking of the staff of favor. So that's the first thing the shepherd pointed out, Zachariah pointed out, that the favor with God was going to be broken because they had turned away. They had gone, become evil. They had become greedy. Then the st second staff of union was representing the brotherhood of all Israel and the unity of the 12 tribes as one. It was the unity of the nation of Israel. But we know there was rebellion between Israel and Judah and that rebellion had grown to the point beyond a point of no return and they actually became two kingdoms. They were known as the Northern Kingdom and Southern Kingdom. So the one nation, the 12 tribes, has already been split into two kingdoms. After Zechariah talks about breaking of the staff called Union, basically the brotherhood of Israel disintegrates even farther. So besides the two kingdoms, now you have uh, more factions that were developed as this union was broken. We see the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Herodians, and the Zealots as other examples of the breaking of the union of the nation of Israel. Now, that is some of the background of this passage. But really what caught my eye as I was reading this whole passage was the reference to 30 pieces of silver. What do you think of when you hear 30 pieces of silver? Judas, right? That's immediately where my mind went to. When I heard 30 pieces of silver, I immediately went to Judas betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now, this could be a prediction of that betrayal. That's what I got when I first read it. I was like, oh, this is a prediction of the betrayal that's going to happen to Jesus by Judas and what the value they put on God and the prophets and the Son. But I think first, we really need to understand what 30 pieces of silver really means. And this is one of the things that catches me. Because when we're talking about our own worth or how much do we value ourselves, I would hope that each one of us feels that we are truly valued. In this passage, though, other people are putting the value on the work of the shepherd. And the shepherd here could be also the work of the prophets, could be the work, you know, the worth of God. Shepherd kind of covers that whole genre. And the shepherd is fed up. He's ready to leave. And he just wants to be paid. And he says, basically, pay me what I'm worth and I'll move along. And they chose to pay him 30 pieces of silver. Have you ever got that fed up where you say, you know what, we're done. Just pay me what you owe me and I'm out of here, right? Any of you have ever been that way at work, right? <laughs> yep. Um, actually, when I left CNS to, to go to the seminary, I had a, a discussion with my boss on Wednesday afternoon. Thursday morning, I said, you know what, we're done. Come up with a severance package. I'm out of here on Friday. And that's what we did. We came up with, pay me what we're worth. This is over. So that's what this shepherd is basically saying. Pay me what I'm worth and I'll move on. Or if you're not going to pay me, fine. I'm out of here. So they chose to pay him 30 pieces of silver. Now, the biggest problem I have with this when I read this passage, I have no idea what 30 pieces of silver is really worth in this time in history. Is that a good price? Is that a fair price? Or is that a really bad price? How many of you have that same struggle? Do you know what 30 pieces of silver is worth in this time in history? If you don't know what that amount means or is worth, it kind of makes it hard to interpret this passage. Or it, it's hard, it makes it inter hard to interpret what Judas did. So, of course, this required me to go a little deeper to figure out what 30 pieces of silver is worth. So, 30 pieces of silver would be considered an insult to the shepherd. And, and I'm sure some of you assumed it wasn't a good price. But let me tell you what it is. Let's put it in perspective. A slave that has been gored by an ox was worth 30 pieces of silver. So, basically... This would be considered the lowest possible price you could pay because this would buy you an injured slave. So if they got gored by an ox 
And if you've read scripture, getting gored by an ox, seems like it was a kind of a common occurrence because it was mentioned. So you got gored by a bull, you're injured, you can't do all your work. That's 30 pieces of silver. That's what that pays for. So they thought so little of this shepherd that they really weren't, they were going to pay him the lowest amount possible to pay him. Now, we know that Zechariah was fed up and he mentioned their greed and their self-indulgence and their evil desires. And this whole price of 30 pieces of silver just confirmed everything that he had said to them beforehand. It was just kind of, you know, hitting the nail on the head. I just proved my point. Now, now that we know how little 30 pieces of silver actually was in biblical times, we saw how little respect that the people had for God and his prophets. And if you take that to Judas and Jesus, how um, little respect the religious leaders had for Jesus. We also realize that that was the lowest amount possible. Then the shepherd mentions it about throwing it to the potter. Now we need to understand that the potters were considered the lowest social class of the time. So now you're throwing it to the lowest social class and even they don't care. So we're getting a better idea what this 30 pieces of silver means. So, and then we realized that was the amount used to betray Jesus. So when we look at what people and the religious leaders were willing to pay for the price on Jesus, it shows that they really didn't think very highly of him. They didn't have a high opinion. They just saw him as basically a trouble and something they just need to get rid of. And it's not worth our time and effort. We'll give you 30 pieces of silver. Now, knowing what the Pharisees did and the value they put on Jesus, who was the son of God, and how they valued him, now we can think about our own value. All right? Because I was talking about thinking about our own self-worth. For each person who sit here and struggles with their personal self-worth, for each person who feels that they are unwanted or who feel that they are isolated and, and put, put aside, understand that God has put a much higher value on you than the people ever put on him. The people who wanted Jesus dead thought he was worth a damaged slave. But Jesus thinks that every one of you is priceless. So much so that he was willing to give up his own life so that you could be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But you can take that word world out and replace it so it reads, God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. Each one of you is worth so much more than 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus was willing to give up his life to prove it. You are all loved and valued very much. In a world that seems to become even more distant, and relationships that become even more shallow, Remember, God was willing to give everything to let you know that he loves you. Don't allow yourself to feel alienated, isolated, or alone. Get plugged in with a group that will help your relationships grow and build a stronger bond with the Father that truly loves you and his Son, Jesus Christ. Because that is truly priceless. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we think about what the people value Zechariah, what they value Jesus, the religious leaders, what they value Jesus, when we talk about a country and a world that's been in a pandemic for over two years where people have been isolated and alone and, you know, lo losing that human contact, um, when we have everything on our smartphones and on our tablets and on our computers, and we sit across the table and text each other rather than have a conversation. We know that all the technology in the world does not replace the bonds that come from face-to-face -face interaction. Doesn't replace the relationships 
that are bond sitting around a table making eggs or handing food out or whatever you do with other people. Being able to see people's faces when you're able to bless them and pray with them and just have conversation. I heard uh, someone mention this morning how this time of the year they start to get cabin fever. It's the winter thing that we can't wait till the weather gets warmer. Just remember those who've been in cabin fever for two years. For us to have the bonds that come with relationships, that strengthen communities, that strengthen churches, that strengthen civic organizations, that only happens when people come together. It's so, we are so, so thankful that we are able to come together and worship. Yes, we still take precautions so we don't get sick, but we need to have that face-to-face. -face. Sue will tell you, I hate talking on the phone. If I have to talk, I'd rather be able to talk to somebody face-to-face. -face. Then you can see the reactions. They can see my sarcasm, and they're not offended by it. They don't see that over the phone or in an email or a text. So Lord, as we come together and bond again, as the weather starts to get warmer and we start to get outside, let us say hi to our neighbors, say hi to each other, but also born, build those bonds that will help us continue to grow with you. We saw how little they valued you in biblical times. And we know how much you value us. So Lord, may we continue to grow and build our relationship with you as we work on our spiritual journey and just grow closer. Lord, in your all-powerful and precious name, amen.